I think what India is growing, you know, uh, is a modern Indian fascism and Modi has a big role to play in it, of course. I think we need to use the word fascism. We need to draw people's attention to what is happening in India. And, uh, you know, and, and it does have all the characteristics that one needs, you know. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Is the Bhima Koregao case a bellwether for Indian democracy? And if the answer is yes, what does that tell us about the state of democracy in India? And what does it tell us about the character of the regime that rules over us? Answers to those questions are in this book and I'll hold it up. Here it is. It's called The Incarcerations, Bhima Koregao and the Search for Democracy in India. And its author is the recently appointed Professor of Social Anthropology at Oxford University and a Fellow of All Souls College, Alpa Shah. Today, Professor Shah is my guest. Professor Shah, let's start with the Bhima Koregao case before we broaden our discussion to talk about the state of Indian democracy and the character of the present regime. You write, the Bhima Koregao case is a bellwether for the collapse of democracy in India. Can you start by explaining what's brought you to that conclusion? Well, a bellwether, Karan, is something that anticipates trends. And I think we shouldn't romanticize Indian democracy in the past. However, what happened with the Pima Corrigan case is something quite extraordinary. For the first time in Indian history, you know, a whole set of people across the country, intellectuals, human rights defenders, were raided on a series of nights by the by the police, and then suddenly found themselves tied up in a case of inciting violence in a place which many of them had not even heard of, Bhima Koregao. And it was said that they were waging a war against the Indian state, plotting to assassinate the prime minister. And on those grounds, the police incarcerated them over a period of time. And they incarcerated them under these anti-terror laws that India has, in which it's possible to do that without even um, having a trial, and in, in which bail is impossible. You know, so it's more than five years later, um, almost six years now, um, most of the Pima Corregao 16 are still in prison. So this goes beyond routine forms of anti-journalistic, anti-activist actions that we've seen in the past. But what we've seen since the case, you know, it was like it was it sent the message. Many, many other people have been raided. Many people have had, you know, um, the enforcement director, the tax authorities turn up at their doorsteps to basically silence them. And then we've had the incarceration of, we've had the incarceration of students. We've had the incarceration of journalists. We've had the incarceration of chief ministers of states. You know, so the Prima Corregao case, you know, marked this moment where, you know, suddenly it was like the midnight knock could be, you know, it could happen, you know, was was around the corner, could happen any time on your door. And, um, you know, that's that's the trend which the Bhima Koregao case really set in place, um, which, yeah. of course, was happening in the past, but it really showed how this could happen anywhere in the country to anyone, people of any profession, you know, yeah. You're right, and I'm quoting you, the BK case provides a window into the domination of the judiciary, moral policing by vigilante groups, the subordination of the police force to the government of the day, the misuse of draconian anti-terror laws, and how the media propagates the government version of events. In other words, would I be right in saying the BK case is a microcosm of the larger Indian reality? Absolutely. I think it's a wonderful window into what's going on in India at large right now. Now let's take the police. What did the police do? The police um, went, you know, US top top cyber forensic um, companies across the world have shown how 
the police basically were involved in who who were in uh, who were making the arrests were also tied up in um implanting material that was found on the computers of the BK16 which was used to make their arrests right so all the electro all the evidence used to incarcerate the BK16 was found on their computers what's been shown is that the implantation of that evidence and and the, the police there was a direct relationship between them uh, what's been shown is you know then that police force has been totally backed up when uh, when the government in maharashtra changed and said let's have a probe into what the police did in the in the bima koregaon case the police the, the the case was taken out of the hands of the maharashtra police and put up into the central anti terror task force the nia you know so it was the police was like backed up in its in its actions uh, i interviewed one of the police officers you know who was participating uh, in in this who was leading actually the investigations and he was convinced that these people are urban naxals you know that it is that what has happened um is that they they really should be in in in, in prison but but the methods that have been used the ways in which they've been um incarcerated have been clearly shown by you know top researchers to uh, to be extremely dubious uh on the one other hand the, one of the very sad and disturbing aspects of the bhima bhima koregaon case is the way the judiciary and separately the way the media let them down of the judiciary you say judges were recusing themselves one after another from hearing petitions related to the bk case by may 2022 as many as 10 judges had recused themselves of the media you say it declared the bk activists to be guilty before the matter even reached the courts so two institutions that have that were expected to rise to the defense of the bk 16 not only failed to do so but it would seem they actually refused to do so absolutely these are considered you know the pillars of democracy the last bastions of democracy the judiciary and the media and what's happened in this case i mean i you know i there are amazing lawyers who are fighting fighting for the bk16 there are judges who have given bail judgments recently shoma sen came out of jail so i'm not giving up a complete hope but look at you know the, the current just chief justice of india justice chandra chud was one of the original dissenting judges at the time of the bk16 arrest that the second five arrests and he said you know that um basically unpopular voices shouldn't just be muzzled he basically said that dissent is the safety valve of democracy at that time he is today the chief justice of india but nine of the bk16 are still in prison are still in uh, still in custody um You, you know look at stan swami a 80 you know more than 80 year old 83 year old jesuit priest who could hardly even lift the cup to drink water he was put in prison incarcerated in this case during the covid pandemic and died in in custody people call this a custodial murder you know uh, in in you know top top historians top scholars of the country have called this a custodial murder you know so you really see that how the the, the judiciary has been has been really compromised and you know when surendra gadling so remember that three of the bk16 were human rights lawyers right and one of them stan swami had filed a petition against the jharkhand state for incarcerating thousands of adivasis indigenous people in the forests of jharkhand under anti terror laws without any any charges without a case and without without bail right so he was then incarcerated under the same laws that he was fighting so when that when that happens when human rights lawyers when 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 uh, legal activists are are jailed what did they do surendra gadling one of the human rights lawyers who was incarcerated in this case he went to the media he said i you know i am declaring a maha emergency i th- there is no hope left in the court so i am going straight to the media and what was he doing he said i am emulating what four supreme court judges did earlier that year in 2018 when they went to the press so concerned about the judiciary and when they when they said that you know we are we are we are we are worried about democracy in this in this country oh. judges don't go to the press like that you know and the so, press, tell me what was- the press response but give me a brief answer what was the press response when he went to them 
Well, well, the press, they, they, it was not covered in most of the mainstream media. The, the arrest of the BK-16 was not covered in the mainstream media. In fact, the press was propagating the idea that these were urban Naxals without even having, uh, you know, looked at, you know, without, without the investigation even underway. The press was called to the police. The police held press conferences to put their version of the story out immediately after making the arrests. And the press propagated this. I'm not saying that there is no hope in the press. There are amazing journalists. But the main point you're making is that both the judges at the time and the judiciary that were hearing the case and the press, instead of supporting the BK-16, let them down. That's the main point you're making. Not only let them down, but, you know, in terms of some of the media, they were complicit. You know, they they propagated the police version of events. They created this whole hue and cry in the country that, oh my God, now the Naxalites are also in the cities. You know, there are urban Naxals out there. They're everywhere. And then this idea has been okay. used since then. Now, you make one other very important point about the BK case when you ask the question in your book, why target BK-16? Why were they so dangerous? And your answer is, and I'm quoting you, India has a long and robust tradition of democratic rights activists who you call the last bastion of democracy. And you say, by targeting BK-16, a message was being sent out. And again, I'm quoting you, a strong message to anyone daring to do similar kinds of work that one day there could also be a knock at your door. Comply with the regime hide inside your shell, or else you too may find yourself in jail. In other words, as Voltaire said of Admiral Bing, this was a clear case of pour encourager des autres. In other words, we are going to set an example by the way we treat you to frighten everyone else from daring to do the same ever again. Absolutely. I think this is absolutely crucial. They could have picked up a whole set of other people, but they picked up these people. It didn't really matter which ones, you know, but these people happened to get caught in it. And this was sending a message to everyone who does this kind of work. And I just want to say something about this work because it's really extraordinary. I think India has a very rich tradition of democratic rights activists that have really they grew especially after the Indian emergency, you know, when people said, we are never going to let such violation of human rights happen in our country. And organizations like People's Union of Civil Liberties, People's Union of Democratic Rights, so many and so many different organizations across the country grew. And these were people who were, did not get funding. So they never had any foreign funding, you know, so NGOs have been clamped down on in the current regime with, you know, the tax authorities raiding their houses. So they, they can be silenced through tax authorities. But these are people who have only their labor, the sacrifice of their lives, who are working with indigenous communities, Adivasis, to stop the mining corporations from taking over their lands, who are working with Dalits to make sure that the 200 million Dalits, yeah. which is a big... These are critical people, and that point is very well made. These are people who, in fact, the media and the judiciary sort of been supporting the fact that they didn't is deeply distressing. These are also people who the government chose to target because their work was exposing the demeaning underside of what the government was doing. So would I be right in saying that the Bhima Korega case reveals that what you call the crisis of Indian democracy cannot simply be reduced to just Hindu nationalism, to simply the personality, the strength and the power of the prime minister. There's a lot more under the surface that intermingles and is interconnected. Bhima Korega exposes all of that in that one instance alone. I think so. I think that, um, you know, obviously the, the personality and persona of Prime Minister Modi is is so impressive on a global scale. He is almost like, you know, he's a, he's created himself as a demagogue. But it it can't um he he can't be explained by himself. You know, there is a whole set of organizations that he has grown up in that are behind him. You know, the Hindu nationalist agenda has been working in India for the last hundred years, and it in, involves a whole series of organizations, the RSS, uh, you know, then a whole series of organizations like 
student student movements in in the universities farmers unions labor unions a whole education st structure and setting all up all of that is revealed and all of that is revealed through the bima koregaon case which is why bima koregaon reveals the entire depth width and intricacy of what lies under the surface of what we glibly simply call hindu nationalism is that right I think so and you know if you go back to the original violence in which these people then the BK16 have been in, implicated you know what was that that was a war memorial that the dalits were using for the you know many many decades to celebrate as a kind of dalit pride um celebration against uh caste oppression right and there the hindutva forces on the ground were objecting to the celebration of what was essentially it was a british war memorial the Br dalits were were i, were I don't want to get lost in those details professor shah but i take the point you're making the bhima koregaon is simply the front picture of a much deeper rooted wider problem that needs to be exposed against that background let's then come to the reality of india you call it a country where inequality is growing where minorities are being hatefully and barbarically silenced where elections have become a mere ritual where if you speak out against the government and its policies you risk being dragged away by the security forces those are critical details the west either hasn't recognized or if it's recognized it hasn't given the importance they deserve to them would you accept that i think western governments really um need india they need india for foreign investment they need india for their trade ties they need india because it's not china you know that china is is seen as an authoritarian regime explicitly but uh it, you know india is very it's it's the fastest growing economy it's one of the fastest growing economies it's the hugely populous nation they need to be cozy with india there are of course in the west uh, lots of people the vdem institute has said that india is now an electoral autocracy it's really down on the ratings of democracy there's the financial times calling out india as an authoritarian regime economists india sleepwalking into uh, authoritarianism you know so there's lots of critique coming from the west as well but in terms of the ruling regimes including my own government you know there is a complete there is there is actually complicity with the modi regime modi is and um, is given a platform at the democracy summit last year by biden you know in the us where he is able to say that we are not only the largest democracy but we are the mother of democracy we are the oldest democracy seeking to displace you know athens from and greece from from being from having that that um that place modi is allowed to host the g20 you know i mean this well, is hang a, on a second it's not a question of allowed to host the g20 20 i must correct you that the g20 is hosted turn by turn by every member it's not permission granted to modi we can't we can't of be course, unfair to him course, carry on of course, of course yeah i didn't i didn't mean literal literally i'm just saying that this is this this all of this allows you know a kind of a uh, uh, propping up this regime and 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 a complicity with saying that this is all this is all this is all fine and yes not no questions raised within this reality you say of indian and muslims that they have quickly been made into second class citizens in india if citizens at all we're talking of nearly 15% of the population or 200 million people approximately it's one of the biggest muslim populations in the world and yet these are people who are equal indian citizens to hindus to christians to jains to buddhists to sikhs but they've been made deliberately insecure and they are probably full of fear Well, we've had an exclusion of Muslims at all levels, from the legislative level to the what's happening on the streets, you know, and you see that very clearly in the Citizenship Amendment Act, which excludes Muslims. It ex includes everyone else, but it excludes Muslims. Um, we see that also in uh, what's happening on the streets, where now it is fine for you know young men and and sometimes women to 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 come out and live. inch people saying that this there is love jihad going on or land jihad going on you know which is basically 
accusing Muslim men of taking it, taking either uh, Hindu women or taking the land of uh, Hindus, you know. So this like moral policing, which is allowed on the streets, which goes unchecked. Of course, we have had riots in the country. Uh, you know, back in 2002 was the most notorious case when more than a thousand Muslims were murdered you know and that is a modest estimate and um there was you know no that, that that nothing none of that has been called into account um so it, something. It, how much of this can be in a sense suggested by the Koregao case that we're talking about how much of this is symbolically represented by the Pima Koregao case what's happening to Muslims what's happening to inequality, what is happening to minorities, what is happening to the government and its policies and the way they're propagated by the press. How much of that is symbolized by the Pima Kauragao case? I would say all of it is. You know, you didn't allow me to go into the details. You have to go into the details in order to show that, of course. But if you looked at what happened at Pima Kauragao, there were riots there, right? There were riots there where basically Hindutva instigators had 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 started instig had started attacking dalits and you know this was representative of a, of how mobs are being created on the street to throw molotov cocktails at each other to throw stones at each other and because they didn't want this celebration of dalit pride to happen and the instigators of this violence you know they were they were initially one of them was arrested but okay. then he was let out of prison and a whole set of other people were arrested who are these other people they were the ones who are fighting against inequality on the ground. You know, so if you look at their lives and the work that they did, you will see all of those other issues that you are just raising right now, the ways in which inequality is rising in India. India is one of the most unequal countries in the world. The complicity is of- Is that why you chose to write about the Pima Koregao and you added in your title, The Search for Democracy in India, because you passionately believe that this story of the BK-16 symbolizes the deeper, larger, more depressing, distressing reality, which is the truth of India. The connection between the two is what made you write this book. Uh, I, I think that I, I was asked to write a book about the BK-16 by my last editor. He said, we need somebody to write this. I thought, well, I can or can't. I don't, I'm not sure. It's, you know, I was like, I felt very um, burdened by this because I knew some of the BK-16. I knew their work as scholars. You know, they were colleagues, some of them. And But when I started looking deeper into the case, when I started diving right in into it, this book grew from 60,000 to 160,000 pages because what it, it that's exactly what it revealed it revealed a whole microcosm which told a much bigger story of the collapse of democracy in india and yeah. that's why it became so fascinating and so interesting and also so important to tell in a really big way hi i'm karan thapar over the last few years i hope you've been watching my program the interview on the wire during that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Let's move one step further. In your book, you ask, how should we characterize the current Indian regime? Would I be right in saying that your answer is, and I'm quoting you, a modern Indian fascism? And you add, Indian fascism may not be of the classic kind, whatever that is, but it's fascism nevertheless. For those who haven't had the benefit of reading your book, can you explain what you mean by that term, a modern Indian fascism. 
Well, I agonized a lot over this. Um, and you know, what I what I've concluded is that, you know, we are the 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 democracy, authoritarianism, fascism, they're they're on a they're on a kind of sliding scale. You know, we can go that way and we can go this way, right? And there are certain ingredients that are needed, you know, to go to go further down down the line. And what I think d- diving deep into this case and into what is happening in India right now showed a few essential ingredients that I think are, are important for fascism. What One is what are those? Yeah. One is the creation of um, a mythic past that is going to be, you know, a glorious mythic past that is going to be reproduced now. Uh, And we see that very much in the rhetoric of how, you know, India has been colonized for a thousand years. And finally, with this new regime, we are going to be glorious once again. We have the idea of a kind of you know, a superhuman race, a, a race that is going to be superior to everybody else. And we see that very clearly, you know, in how also how Modi presents himself, you know, as this kind of reincarnator of Ram himself, you know, and on certain occasions, a, a kind of a, a strong uh, a strong, um, a, a strong Indian, you know, Hindu, Hindu nation that is going to that 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 the superhuman uh, um, race is is going to is going to um, uh-huh. Look after. Then you have the exclusion of certain people, uh, um, uh, and you know, violent exclusion of certain people, an enemy that is created, right? And in this case, it is very clearly Muslims, Adivasis, and Dalits. Yes, you give up your Christianity. You can come back into the Hindu fold. You are fine. You are fine. You know, uh, everybody else can basically come into this version of Hindu Hinduism, but the but the Muslims are the are the enemy. You have mobs on the street ready to create, you know, um, ready to take up uh, violence uh, uh, to to police people without even, you know, uh, authorities giving orders. You have the curtailment of um, dissent, you know, so any form of dissent is like, you know, violently, you know, you have to all march with, with the same tune as the regime in power. Also, you have a nexus between the government and corporations. That is also really, you know, really, really crucial, I think. Uh, okay. And then, of course, you have the control of the institutions, control of <laughs> education, what's taught in textbooks, uh, what, what's history is taught in textbooks. You have the control of universities. You have the control of the judiciary media, things that we've talked about, you know, before. Let me, let me put it like this. You write in your book, Terms like majoritarianism or ethnic democracy or cultural nationalism, none of these terms, you say, convey the gravity of the threat to democracy which is underway in India. And even if it sounds as if I'm somewhat getting you to repeat yourself, what's missing from those terms? What is it that those terms don't cover? Because I assume the difference between those terms and the full meaning is what is Indian fascism. So what is it that these terms don't cover? Think about some of those terms, you know, cultural nationalism. Well, okay, what's wrong with that? You know, I'm sure even the regime in power might actually like to claim that, you know, or what's wrong with Hindu nationalism? Yeah, Hindu is, Hinduism is a, is a lovely religion, you know. What it doesn't convey, what these lovely terms don't convey is the violence that is at stake, you know, the violence on ordinary people on the streets, the violence, you know, the fear of being persecuted, the fear of being killed, lynched, and incarcerated. You know, for, forget other forms of silencing. There are so many forms of silencing going on. There's a lot of self-silencing going on as well, you know. So that is what I think many of these terms do not convey with the same gravity, you know. It's uh, the and absence of, you're saying it's the absence of violence that these terms don't convey. The violence on the streets in actual physical terms, but also the violence in the treatment, in the attitude, in the behavior, in the way people are perceived. That violence, both metaphoric and physical and real, is what's missing. And also the violence people are having to inflict on themselves, the self-silencing, that is a form of violence too, you know? So it's, yes, this like the gravity, I think, of all of the, what is going on in India is not captured in the same way by all of the other terms. And this violence can then explode, right? At any moment to have what we had, what we have had in in past phases of Indian history, for example, you know? So, yeah. Let me, Professor Shah, 
how much of the responsibility and blame for this? And I'm talking about the situation that you described as a modern Indian fascism. How much of the responsibility and blame lies squarely with Narendra Modi? In other words, if he had not been prime minister, would we have reached this point? I don't think it lies just with Narendra Modi. I think it lies with all of us, actually. You know, I think we're all complicit. Let me tell you a little story. You know, when I I wrote it in the book too. You know, which is when I was when I was young, I I was brought up in Nairobi in Kenya, and there was a school opposite my aunt's house. You know, it was a shaka school. I didn't know it was a shaka school. It looked lovely. You know, people were playing, and I wanted to go to it. I really I was really wanted to go to it, and then I realized, of course, that only boys were allowed. But many of the the people I have grown up with, you know, went to those schools. Many of my uncles and aunts are today Modi supporters, you know, they and and the Shaka groups and the Shaka cells and are are really great community builders for people in the in the diaspora. So we are all complicit, you know, we have all been complicit in 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 giving support to and the rise of these institutions, institutions and organizations, which have a more can than I, can I, can I When you say you can't blame Modi exclusively or only Modi, and you add that we're all complicit, are you saying that even if he hadn't become prime minister, even if he hadn't won two sweeping mandates and he's perhaps poised on winning a third, we would still have developed into what you call a modern Indian fascism. Is that what you're suggesting? That there was a certain inevitability to it, which would have made it happen regardless of whether Modi had been prime minister or not. I don't know, Karan. It's very hard to kind of, um, you know, look at the what what if, you know. But um, I think that we have to give respect to the incredible um, strategy, strategizing, the persona of Modi, like what he's able to capture in the hearts and minds of Indian people. Like he is extraordinary, you know, and his kind of relationship with Amit Shah, with other members, you know, of the RSS. And I know there are people who, who haven't also supported him. But um, but I think, you know, that, yes, I think he has, and, you know, the fact that he came from, uh, you know, he was a Chaiwala, he presents himself as this Chaiwala who has risen, risen well, to... What's the, the point the, you're the, making the, behind that? That, it, that his anti-establishment, you know, that the previous regimes were seen, like Congress Party has seen, been seen very much as, 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 a, as, a, as a party. But can, that, can I interrupt that, again? If we have to respect all these qualities and attributes that Modi has... Are you coming around to suggesting that without those qualities and attributes, we wouldn't have become a modern day fascism? Because I began by asking how much of the responsibility and blame lies with him. And you began by answering, you can't blame Modi exclusively, we're all complicit. But now when you say we must respect these attributes and qualities that he has, you're sort of suggesting the opposite of your first answer, that well, maybe no, not without at all. him, we wouldn't have become think- fascist. The common thing about this conversation is because you interrupt me, I couldn't finish what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to look at we need to look at all sides of this, right? We need to look at the organizations and institutions that are supporting Modi. We need to look at Modi himself and how in- extraordinary a leader he's been. And we also need to look at all of our roles, you know, and the op- the, the opposition, the the the, the fa- fact that, that I understand. But can I ask you this? How much of the responsibility in sense of proportionate terms, how much of the responsibility and blame lies with him as prime minister? Or do you excuse him entirely? Oh, no, I can't excuse him entirely. Of course not. You know, of course not. He is a mastermind. He is, you know, he he, he is he is extraordinary, as I've been saying. I think I think we cannot separate all of these things. You know, um, we, we cannot separate all of the mix of the conjuncture of all of these things coming together. The fact that we have a Modi type person, the fact that we've had this extraordinary history of organization that has been much better than any other organization from from any any other parts of of Indian society, so I think all of these things have to be, and then our, our own roles in it. You know, we have to look all, all of these things together. Now, there's one more point about the present regime that you make in your book that I think is very important. You argue it's worse than Indira Gandhi's emergency of seventy five seventy seven. You write, and I'm quoting you: "In many senses, the current regime is worse." because it has silently taken over state institutions, the media, and crushed ordinary people through incarceration, vigilante policing, and terror tactics without the need to declare extraordinary circumstances. Then you add, when it comes to Muslims, 
The regime is based on a politics of hate that did not exist during the emergency. And you make this point extremely forcefully in your book. So why do Modi and his government repeatedly get away by criticizing the emergency when their regime, as you argue, is considerably worse? Exactly, because they're not present. Uh, you know, the, the, the emergency was something that was declared. Everyone knew what was going on, you know, uh, in the and under the emergency. And, and so, of course, Modi wants to be seen as a human rights defender, wants to be seen as a Democrat. And that is a period in Indian history to hold up. But um, as you know, as we never want to go back there. But at the same time, look at how the you know we were talking about the media. Like many people in India or abroad do not know what is happening in the country at large. They do not know about the BK sixteen, for example. They do not know that there are thousands of Adivasis in the jails of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh who are just there languishing in jail on trumped up charges. You know, and and will just die there. Will rot there. Most of them. You know. Uh, so they do not know what is at stake in 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 so many parts of India and for so many aspects of society because this is not covered. It's not covered in the press. It's not covered. Uh, it's 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 in not other words, ignorance of the truth of Modi's India makes people believe and accept the line that Modi propagates that the emergency was different and worse. But it's ignorance of the truth of Modi's India that leads people down that road. Oh, so now the question is a different question. But why is it that people are complicit in 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 Modi's um, in Modi's regime? Well, I mean, that is a different question. The Mo Modi's, I mean, y yes. No, no, no. no. I'm not talking like about talented. complicity. I'm simply saying the reason Modi can get away criticizing the emergency, even though his regime is considerably worse than the emergency, is because people are ignorant of how bad things are under Modi. I think a lot of people do turn a blind eye to what is going on. And yes, many of the atrocities are not presented to people. They are not in the press. They are not on national television. They are not, you know, on nas in national newspapers. So how are people meant to find out about, you know, the, the atrocities and the brutality of what is happening every day on the streets of India? Um, I think that 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 is a, that is a big part part uh, of um of what is what what is what is going on but at, well, at the same time you know there hasn't been an organization there hasn't there haven't been mass movements that we really need against what is what okay. showed what is happening you know to 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 uh, well, would, you, would you accept one thing that although it's hard to exclusively or primarily or mainly blame modi for the fact that india has become a modern day fascism even though that's difficult and hard to do, as we discussed a moment ago, would you accept that India under Modi is a modern Indian fascism? I I guess. I mean, India under Modi is a... I, well, yeah, India... I think what India is growing, you know, uh, is a modern Indian fascism, and Modi has a big role to play in it, of course. You when know. you say India is growing into, or is, has India become, which of the two? As I said, current these things are a sliding scale, right? Absolutely. But and, and, and we don't want to get to that end point of what happened under fascism in other countries, right? And that is but the but reason. You, but you identified, but, but, but Professor Shah, you identified seven critical characteristics of fascism, each and every one of which applies to Modi's India, which is why I ask, is it a modern Indian fascism today? And in your book, in your book, and I'm quoting you, you call it a modern Indian fascism. So I take it we are now under Modi, a modern Indian fascist state. I'm just asking for a yes or no clarification. I think we need to use the word fascism. We need to draw people's attention to what is happening in India. And I, you know, and and it does have all the characteristics that one needs, you know, and so we need to basically, really, it's 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 a it's a call for attention, you know, that we need to now start using these labels so that we can call to check, so that we do not get to the endpoints that we have had in other nations in history, you know. So we need we need to draw attention, and I think that 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 this is the moment in which we have to use use these use terms like fascism absolutely i'm just repeating what you said 
we need to call India a modern fascism. Are you concurring and agreeing? Yes, I said it in the book. We need to use these terms, you know. We need to call the regime fascist. This will come, this will come as a bit of a surprise to many who haven't opened their eyes to the truth, which is emerges so strongly in your book, and I'll hold it up once again. But it is the truth as you see it. As a social anthropologist, as someone who has studied India, as someone who's gone into incredible detail about the Bhima Koregao case, this is your considered opinion about India today. We need to call let's, India a modern fascism. Let's let's end on some hope, you know. Because oh, I'm coming to that, but I'm first getting confirmation of the summing up. I'll come to the mo hope in a moment. So look, there are, so I think the hope is tied to this because what I, you know, you are making me like kind of like 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 pin down something which whose complexity I have been trying to get over in our conversation and in the book itself, right? There is a kind of sliding scale and there is hope, you know, there is hope. There are seeds of democracy everywhere, right? Uh, and we need to grow those seeds. And let's, by let's calling... come to them because that's the paradox on which your book ends. Yeah. It's a deeply depressing, if not distressing book, as the complexity of the situation begins to hit and you begin to realize that you're actually speaking an undeniable truth when you describe India, and I'm quoting you once again as a modern Indian fascism. And yet that depressing note and that depressing book ends on a paragraph of three sentences of enormous hope for the future. I want to quote those three sentences. You say, the seeds of democracy will be preserved within fascism. One day they will have the conditions to flourish this is where the hope for our common future lies. And I have only one simple question to ask. Are those seeds likely to survive another Modi victory? Remember, voting began today. If he wins the elections when the results are announced on the 4th of June, will those seeds of hope, those seeds of democracy survive? Absolutely. Of course, they will survive, you know, and this is the complexity I've been trying to get across. You know, I think we I see things. So we all as human beings, we are not, you know, innately democratic and we are not innately tyrannical. You know, we have all of these things within us and it's the structures that are around us, the, the qualities that others nurture in us, the social relations we build with each other that is going to draw out certain aspects of us, you know, so we we are both like democratic and tyrannical and can be fascist, you know, all of us, you know, we can be, we can be complicit in this regime, uh, yeah. which is a fascist regime. So I think the seeds of democracy are being preserved everywhere, everywhere in India, in this huge country, which is a diverse country. Yes, they may be silenced right now. Yes, they may be only flourishing in prison right now. Yes, they may be in, you know, I don't know back in London, in the universities here, being back here where our conversation, our conversation is a seed of democracy, you know? It what is... you're saying to me is this, no matter how deep and dark the night, no matter how much deeper and darker it may become if he wins a third term on the 4th of June, there will be sunlight one day. There will, of course there will. We will have to work hard to grow that, to grow that light. We will have to all work hard together. Um, but um, yes, of course, of course. Professor Shah, thank you very much for making time for me. And once again, I will hold up this book. It is a true labor of love, if I may use that euphemism, the incarcerations, Bhima Koregao, and the search for democracy in India. Take care, stay safe. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? 
All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.